so I'm Amanda Egerton. I like butterflies. Just wanted to get that out there. Here I am, and here are Lucy and Eli, my kiddos, that you'll see little bits of throughout the presentation today. Uh, we're enjoying some California tortoise shells, which are often in abundance, and we'll talk about that later. But I have been working with the Deschutes Land Trust for over 16 years. I'm the stewardship director. I spend uh, all my time overseeing the management of our conserved lands, the management, the monitoring, the restoration, the public access, and things like that. But my most, uh, in my most favorite part of my job is uh, when I get to be outside with butterflies. And normally I get to host butterfly tours, but as Rebecca mentioned, we can't do that this year. So I'm bringing a little bit of the magic inside. Uh, and the, thank you all for, for gathering. Okay, before I launch into the Central Oregon butterflies, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Deschutes Land Trust in case you're new to us. We are a local nonprofit here in Bend, Oregon, and we work to conserve lands for wildlife, scenic views, and local communities. This is a kind of a visually busy map, and I apologize for that, but at least uh, it shows you our, our, at least a portion of our service area. We work within the Deschutes Basin, which is a little over six million acres, um, but let me just get you oriented. I'm circling my cursor here around Bend. Hopefully you can see that, and over here is Sisters. We have Redmond sort of tucked in between property labels and Prineville and Madras up here. So this is the bulk here of our conserved lands to date. We've conserved a little over 12,000 acres and we're celebrating our 25th year anniversary this year, which we're really excited about. Um, and really, I think the bulk of our success is due to our strong ties with our local communities and to folks like you who are willing to come out and engage with us, whether it's on our properties or behind a computer screen. So just a huge thank you to all of you for taking time out today. It's a sunny day out there and there are lots of butterflies flying around as we speak, uh, but thanks for joining us here for this presentation. So today, talking about Central Oregon butterflies, I will be doing a monarch specific uh, talk a little bit later in the summer, but this one is just to give an overview of some of the more common butterflies you can see in our area. And I have to brag for a second and give a shout out to my son, Eli, who's 11 and took this beautiful picture of uh, an Akman blue, uh, a little bit north of Madras. I think it's an incredible photo. So I had to start with that. Um, and just a little overview of how the talk is gonna go. First, I'm gonna talk about just the basic life history, how a butterfly becomes a butterfly, the life cycle, I guess is another way to phrase that. Then we'll get into the five families of butterflies that you can see here in Central Oregon. Um, we'll talk about some butterfly fun facts. And if you like try to memorize one, then you can impress your friends later. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with just some simple things you can do around your home if you are interested in helping butterflies and other important pollinator species. Okay, to start, Rebecca, do you have the results of the, the poll? How many, I, I made that disappear and now I can't see it. <laughs> yeah, so I have the results. We asked how many species of butterflies are there in Central Oregon? And 25% of people think that there are 25 to 50 species. 25% of people think there are 50 to 75. 31% of people think 75 to 100, and 19% think there are more than 100. So if you haven't had a chance to vote yet, you can vote in your head. But Amanda, what's the answer? Well, maybe I'll just tease you for a second longer before I give you the actual answer. I'll ask you all to think about all the different kinds of habitats we have here in Central Oregon. So. If you're from this area, think about the Badlands, uh, Badlands that are just east of town here in Bend. I'm in Bend. So if I say in town, I apologize. I mean Bend. Um, the Badlands and that desert landscape and like the tiny little monkey flowers that just pop out of the sand um, and, some of the, and some of the other flowers and shrubs and trees that you see there. And then maybe close your eyes and think about the kinds of plants you see when you're up enjoying Elk Lake or Sparks Lake or you're up on a walk in the high cascades. 
And then think again about the Metolius River and hopefully you've had the opportunity to visit that magical place and the types of plants you see there. There's so many different kinds of habitats here. And in all those different habitats, we have lots of different kinds of plants, which means we have lots of different kinds of butterflies. We're actually pretty lucky here. Um, butterflies are very tightly tied to specific species of plants. And we're gonna talk about that more in just a sec. But since we have so many plants, we got a lot of butterflies. The answer is actually over 100 species. We have about 130 species here, which I think is pretty awesome. So let's get on to talking about them. How does a butterfly become a butterfly? I'm gonna use a monarch butterfly because I happen to have a lot of photos of monarchs, um, but to, to demonstrate this life cycle, um, but really all butterflies go through this. There are obviously little variations here and there, but they all start out as an egg laid by an adult. So here in the picture, you see a beautiful adult monarch on the left of your screen. Um, and then you see my finger um, holding a tiny little leaf. This is um, a little narrow leaf, milkweed leaf. This is the monarch butterfly's host plant. So all butterfly species have a host plant. That means one or two or maybe a small collection of plants that they will lay their eggs on. And so like a monarch cannot go lay its eggs on a sunflower or on a firecracker penstemon or on a willow. It has to lay its eggs on milkweed. And other butterfly species, some of them might have, like I said, a, a, a several different species that they'll lay on, but they all have these specific host plants. Um, once they become adults, they're often a little more generalist. They'll sip nectar from a wider variety of plants, but the host plant is the thing that really ties them. Um, and then you can also see a zoom of a monarch egg. Um, it's, I took it with my iPhone through a microscope, so it's not the best, but it's pretty amazing, I think, to see a monarch egg or any butterfly egg up close. Okay, so over here, hopefully you can see my cursor. There's a tiny little mini cat. We call him a little mini cat. It's a teeny tiny little caterpillar that has just eaten outside of its little soft egg shell and or emerged from its egg. When it is this size, so look down everybody at your pinky nail. These little mini cats are shorter than the length of your pinky nail. Now stick up your index finger. After two weeks, they are bigger than your index finger. So pinky nail to index finger, that is crazy. Over 2000 times their size, they grow within about two weeks. Pretty much all they do is eat milkweed leaves and poop, poop a whole bunch, but they sure are cute. So we don't mind the poop so much. Um, after they've reached their full length, at, and during, I should back up and just say during that process, they go through what are called instar stages. So they, they grow, 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 and that skin gets stretched pretty tight, and then it pulls off and it sheds, and it often eats that skin because there's a lot of good nutrients in it, and then it grows more, and it pops off that skin and eats it. And the monarch butterfly caterpillar goes through five of those stages before it reach, reaches its full, full size. Um, once it reaches its full size, it hangs upside down and looks like a J, the letter J. Um, it spins a little silk pad that hopefully you can see there attached to the milkweed leaf. And it just hangs there for like 12 to 24 hours. And if you look at your screen, you see the little antenna um, on the bottom part of the J, so hanging down. And those antenna in this picture are still kind of perky. They're kind of upright. After 12 to 24 hours, sorry, I have to look at my screen to find my advanced slide. Um, now look at the, oh dang, I can't see my cursor. There it is. Do you see how those antenna have become flaccid? They're just hanging straight down. When you see that on a jade caterpillar, you know they are about to shed their final skin. And here it is actually breaking open its final skin and the chrysalis is fully formed underneath the skin of the caterpillar. This is a mind blower if you get to see this in nature. It's not like a moth that will form a cocoon around itself. It actually has the chrysalis underneath, totally crazy. 
Um, anyway, it does this herky-jerky dance thing, swinging around. It looks like it's going to fall off its little silk pad, but it doesn't, thank goodness. Um, and it eventually drops that little bit of skin on the floor. And then you've got your fully formed chrysalis. Here you can see where the wings are going to form, but at the same time, you can still see the caterpillar underneath. Crazy! Uh, within one day, it just becomes all glassy and beautiful and this gorgeous jade color with the gold details. It's like a jewel. Um, and it's very well camouflaged with milkweed leaves. It'll stay in this chrysalis. This is really dependent upon ambient temperatures. So if it's really hot outside, it can transform into a butterfly in like nine days. If it's really cold, it can take over two weeks. Just depends. But when it is ready to pop, the chrysalis goes from being that jade green to being totally clear. You can see through it. And there you can see the wing of the monarch ready to be closed. Absolutely incredible sight. And when you see it looking like this, you know the time is near. It is going to come out of its chrysalis. And here on the left, that monarch has just come out. You can see its abdomen is really fat and full of all of the body fluids. And over the course of the next couple hours, it actually pumps its abdomen. And as it's pumping, the fluid from its abdomen goes out into its wings and expands the wings. So they go from being these little shriveled up things to these long, elegant wings. And then it will hang and do a little bit of flapping to dry and harden. Um, and a couple hours later, it's ready to fly. And there's my daughter Lucy holding on to a freshly eclosed monarch. It is a true wonder of nature to witness the life cycle. Um, just, just incredible. Okay, now let's get into the butterflies that you can see. Monarchs are flying right now. They've been spotted in Medford. They've been spotted in Clarno. They are out and about. So keep your eyes open, folks. Um, but they are few and far between. So let's start looking at some butterflies that you can see right at your back door. This is actually, for those of you who know Sarah Mowry, who works at the Deschutes Land Trust, that's her daughter with a little blue butterfly on her nose. And my Lucy checking it out. This was taken several years ago. Okay, the first family of butterflies that I'd like to talk about just briefly are called skippers. They're super cute. Um, they have a really different body shape than most other butterflies. As you'll see, they tend to be small and stout, often can be confused with moths actually, but they're not. They're actual butterflies. I'll show you a picture a little bit later of a moth versus a butterfly, but the main thing to, to look at here are the antenna. They have that little bulge or club at the end, um, and all butterflies have that. I'm going to have to just rearrange. I'm sitting on the floor, so pardon me. I get uncomfortable <laughs> every once in a while. So over here we have a silver spotted skipper. Hopefully you can read uh, those words on the screen if, if whatever device you're looking at is big enough. This is, in case you can, I'll use my cursor. This is a silver spotted skipper. Lots of these, um, actually right now it's Subtle Lake and around the Metolius. We see this checkered skipper is common everywhere really. We get a lot of them in our yard. Um, you can see them around town in Bend um, and out in the woods as well. And then the woodland skipper. There are several skippers that have this tawny color so they can get a little bit tricky. Um, but these are three pretty common skippers that you might see out and about. Then we have a family that are called the Swallowtails and Parnassians. Um, super common. I wish I could say raise your hand if you've, and I, I can't see you, of course, <laughs> so don't bother. But there's so many, two t or excuse me, Western tiger swallowtails flying around right now. We actually have several species of swallowtails in this area, like five or so. So they're not all Western tiger swallowtails, um, but this is by far the most common. And they're everywhere. They're in the woods. They're by the Deschutes River. They're in the gardens. If you have a mock orange bush in your yard, you're definitely getting ambushed by these guys now. Um, some people confuse these with monarchs. And I think it's really just because of the size. They're, they're big butterflies. Monarchs and swallowtails are some of the biggest butterflies we have here. But as you can see, these guys are very buttery yellow and the monarchs were largely orange. 
So now you know, these are swallowtails. Another really common swallowtail, especially in the Metolius area, is the pale swallowtail, which is on my son's nose here. Don't mind, I pretty, probably every picture of Eli that you'll see in this, there are a few, he'll have some wild colored hair. That's just his thing. Um, but there's a pale swallowtail and here beside the Western tiger swallowtail, you can really see the difference. Western tiger, super buttery yellow, pale swallowtail, very pale. Main difference between the two. Had to put this in. These I don't see as often around here. Um, I have seen Oregon swallowtails on Pilot Butte. I saw this one, actually I took this picture at y Canyon Preserve, if you've been out there. I see them more um, around the Madras area, but do you see the black here? The Western Tiger Swallowtail does not have that. So let me go back for a sec and look at the zebra stripes on the Western Tiger and then look here. They're pretty easy to tell apart. The Oregon Swallowtail is a state insect, so. That's kind of cool. Um, and then another, not super common, but you can see these guys uh, in this family. This is a Clodius Parnassius, which is a real mouthful. Um, you don't have to memorize that. There will not be a test at the end, uh, but they're rad looking. Check that guy out. Um, you can see these along the Tolius. The best bet if you want to see one of these is Iron Mountain. Guaranteed, every time I go there, I see Clodius up there. The cool thing about the Parnassius guys are their, their wings are like wax paper. They're so different from every other butterfly species. If you've ever held a butterfly in your hand or looked at one up close, you'll, you know that they're kind of powdery almost. Um, these guys are not at all like that. They're just like wax paper, totally wild. So anyway, all right, moving on to the third family. This is whites, marbles, and sulfurs. And I love this one. This is called the Sarah's Orange Tip, super cute. These are one of the first spring emergers. If you see a little white butterfly with orange tips, it is the Sarah Orange Tips. No way you're going to confuse it with anything else. And super common in the spring. You can see them along the Deschutes River, Shevlin Park, out in the woods, kind of anywhere. Um, pretty common and cute. There's something about the orange tips I just love. Super common, cabbage white. I'm guessing most of you, if I could do another hand raise, most of you probably have these visiting your yards. Um, a lot of people confuse these with moths because they're really quite simple and plain, but I think they're elegant. Again, notice the little antenna balls on the end, sort of balls-ish, uh, like little clubs on the um, end. That's how you know it's not a moth. I promise I will show you a moth antenna later. Um, but I wanted you all to know this one so that you know it's not a moth and it's called a cabbage white. And it doesn't necessarily specialize in cabbage. Don't know why it's called that. Love these, these are pine whites. These are tricky to see. It's rare to find these on the ground, I think. Um, maybe you've been lucky and you've seen them on the ground. Most of the time, mid to late summer, if you look up in the trees in a pine forest, you will see little white butterflies flitting about way up high in the pine trees. And those are typically pine whites. They actually lay their eggs on pine needles and the little caterpillars eat the pine needles, which is pretty uncommon. Sulfurs. There are lots of different types of sulfurs around here. You can go ahead and call any medium-sized yellow butterfly, you see a sulfur, <laughs> and you'll probably be right. Um, not big, like a swallowtail. These guys are, are definitely way smaller than a swallowtail, um, and they are so cool. Um, I need to put on my reading glasses and get up nice and close. I encourage you to do the same. They have pink antenna. They all have a little pink edge. They've got big, bulging green eyes. It is so cool. Sorry, I, I was getting a text. I want to make sure Rebecca wasn't trying to get my attention. Um, anyway, lots of different kinds of sulfurs around here. Like I said, if you're at the Metolius Preserve, which is one of my favorite places to butterfly, mostly Western and clouded sulfurs out there. Now we're getting to the fun stuff, the gossamer wings, my favorite group. 
Doesn't gossamer sound awesome, romantic? I don't know. It's beautiful. The trick with some of these guys is they can look really similar on the top and totally different on the bottom. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of these so you can start to to get the idea, I often will get a phone call or an email saying, I saw these beautiful blue butterflies. They're tiny little guys and they only live like for a week or two. Um, but I saw these beautiful butterflies. What were they? And I always have to say, I have no idea. Like, unless you can send me a picture uh, of the, the underside, like when it closes its wings, there's, it's really hard to tell them apart. Okay, so these guys look on top. These are spring azures. They're also called echo azures, but I like to keep the name spring azure because they are an early emerger. Uh, they come out really early in the spring, like the orange tips do. So I just think spring azure is a good name for them. Okay, hold on. Okay, this is what they look like underneath. Really fun, but kind of like a chaotic looking pattern of little black dots, right? Okay, so this is top, that's the bottom, or the, technically it's called the ventral side because it's near their bellies. Okay, this is the bottom of an Anna's Blue. Looks totally the same on the top. Once the butterfly closes its wings, you can see it's really different. Here, I'll show you Spring Azure underneath, Anna's underneath, and then the best butterfly in the universe, well, I probably shouldn't say that. I should probably say the monarch is, but really my personal favorite is the Melissa Blue. And it's, it's like a little peacock of the butterfly world. Check out the blue sparkles. These guys actually glitter. If you see this butterfly and the sun hits the wing just the right way, it actually glitters. Unbelievable. And then the orange, I mean, really can't beat it. Other members of this family include cedar hair streak. Here's a cedar hair streak on some showy Townsendia. Super common from backyard to desert and everywhere in between. See these guys all over the place. Purplish coppers, not as common. Really beautiful, super fun. A really great way to find coppers um, in mid to late summer is just to find a patch, of, a really like dense patch of yarrow. They love that stuff. Okay, that was a very brief overview of the gossamer wings. There are so many more species, but we don't have all day. <laughs> Just a little snippet. So let's move on to the last family that we have here in Central Oregon. These are the brushfoots. And I just want to point so that you can see arrows all over your screen. Um, insects have three pairs of legs, okay, six total. On all those previous slides I showed you, you can actually, not maybe in the particular picture I showed you, but all those butterflies have very distinct legs, all six, you can see. These guys, it looks like they have four, and that's because this very, the, the very front pair is reduced in size, it's really tiny, and it's covered with itty bitty little hair so that they look like brush, like a, a paintbrush or, um, one of those brushes you clean out a water bottle with, bristle brush, I don't know what they're called. Anyway, so they're called brush-footed butterflies or an infallidate if you wanna be fancy. Um, anyway, so it does have six legs, it's not cheating, um, they're just reduced. And then this guy here has a, a little comma on him. So this is part of the, the group of brush foots known as commas. Okay, I had to put this one in because this is one of the friendliest butterfly species there is. Red admirals are so easy to get to land on you. Just hang out and hold your hand there and it'll probably land on you. Super fun, very common backyard visitor. If any of you are birders and you're familiar with Empidnax, uh, flycatchers, it's like the bane of the birding world trying to decipher between flycatchers. Um, unless they're singing, then maybe a little bit easier. Butterflies don't sing, unfortunately. Um, but these, the fritillaries can be super tricky. So you see on this child's hand, there's a fritillary with its wings open. It's kind of like the blues. If you just see the top, it's really hard to tell what it is. Once it closes its wings, it's a lot easier. This happens to be a great spangled fritillary, one of the larger fritillaries. Um, not 
The Great Spangled fritillary is not super common. I do see them occasionally at our Metolius Preserve. Um, the Hydaspe and Zarene fritillaries are a little more common around here. This is the Google-eyed wood nymph. We have several, I want to maybe four different species of wood nymphs in our area. And I love googly eyes. I don't know why, but that's why I included this one. I love that it's called the Google-eyed wood nymph. This is actually a super cool adaptation. It's awesome for predator avoidance. One of the main predators of, of butterflies, aside from spiders, is birds. And so when a bird sees this wing, it thinks that its head is, you know, out there on the wing where the eyeballs are, and it'll come in and take a bite of the wing instead of the body, and the butterfly can fly away and be totally fine. They can fly quite well with tattered wings. And I've actually seen wood nymphs with a little triangle missing in the top. And I swear that's where a bird beak was. Okay, super common sighting in Central Oregon are mass collections of California tortoiseshells. It never fails whenever these mass collections, population explosions occur. I get lots of phone calls saying, there are monarchs everywhere. And I so wish that it was true. And I hope that someday it is true. Uh, but for now, if you see a gazillion or like medium sized orange and brown butterflies, it's California tortoiseshells. They're the only ones that cluster in these ridiculous numbers. Um, and their populations just go through natural cycles where for several years we'll have gobs and gobs and then you won't see that many for a while uh, it's just the way they are um, but they are you'll really commonly see them hanging out on trails uh, clustered together like they are in this picture that sue anderson captured they're also pretty friendly um, i put this one in because this is just such a joyous photo um, but this is a great arctic and Something really cool about great arctics is that they only come out every other year. So they're flying right now. You got to go out and see them. They're really pretty. They're, they're, they're kind of subtle in their markings, um, but they have pretty big wings and it's just kind of fun to watch them flying elegantly through the forest. Um, but it takes them two full years to go through their complete life cycle. They actually, they pause at uh, on two different winters in the larval stage, so as a caterpillar, um, and you only see them on even years. Crazy! So that's super fun. They're out now. Go check it out. Another shout out to my son Eli. He took this beautiful photo of a morning cloak that was warming its wings in the early spring sun along the Metolius River. Morning cloaks and the California tortoiseshells are the two most common species that you'll see in this area in the winter when we have a really unseasonably warm day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's because um, they overwinter as adults. Really, most of the butterflies in the um, brushfoot family do overwinter as adults, but it's most common to see these guys come out because they they close up their wings and they hide under leaf litter. They'll hide in wood piles and sheds, wherever they can get cover. And if their body warms up enough, like if you get a 50, mid 50 degree day and like really intense sun, they love it and they'll come out and fly. Um, so what's really interesting is when you see these really starting to emerge from their hibernation in the spring, if it's been a rough winter, like it wasn't a rough winter really last winter, so this one looks pretty good. But if it's been a really rough winter, they'll look really ragged. And then you won't see morning cloaks again all summer long because the ones you see in the spring will mate, lay eggs and die. And then it'll take a full month and sometimes even longer before you see them again. And so you'll start to see them. You might see them in May and June, not really end of June, July. And then you'll start seeing them again in August and September. And the ones you see then are gorgeous it's like chocolate velvet uh, with this beautiful corn silk yellow border um, and that's because they've just enclosed okay and then of course monarchs have to include monarchs they are part of the brushfoot family and they have a very very unique story um, that i will tell you all about the next time we get together I'm just going to hold you in suspense Okay, I promised I would tell you the difference between a butterfly and moth. Very common myth, moths only fly at night. Another one, moths are boring drab colors. Not true. 
of course there are boring it's kind of mean to say that there are um not as exciting colors <laughs> sometimes in the moth family. Um, and of course, there are lots of moths that fly at night, but there are also wild and crazy looking moths that fly in the middle of the daytime, including this awesome, elegant day moth. I actually think it looks kind of like rainbow sherbet or like maybe a Dr. Seuss creation. These guys go bonkers in the woods at the Metolius every summer, and I love seeing them. Their bodies are like big and fuzzy. They're just hilarious. And they fly like, what? Total spaz. Um, but if you focus on the antenna where the arrows are pointing, you can see major difference here between the antenna. So again, the butterfly has just the long, thin antenna with the little swelled portion at the tip. And female moths often will just have the long, slender antenna with nothing at the tip. And the males tend to have the really bushy, um, the really bushy antenna. They look kind of like a fern or like an old guy's eyebrows, really awesome. And that is just to increase the surface area of the antenna, um, which helps it be more receptive to the female's pheromones. So there you go. Okay, moving on to the butterfly fun facts, fun butterfly facts, say that three times fast. Here's my glorious spring azure. Um, I'm pointing to the antenna because it has striped antenna, which is cool. Um, but really, I'm pointing to the antenna because butterflies can smell with their antenna. Butterflies can also taste with their feet, which is a good deal if you spend a lot of time walking around on flowers. Butterflies are environmentally uh, conscious. They carry their own straws around with them. They sip through what is called a proboscis, which is a long, hollow tube. And in fact, if you ever get to see a butterfly actually close from the chrysalis, when it comes out, I've watched this with monarchs, the proboscis is actually in two separate pieces and it zips the straw together and rolls it up underneath. Uh, it, it spirals up. I don't think I have a good picture of that uh, when it's not in use, but pretty neat sipping straw um, and they're solar powered. So here's a fritillary. Um, again, not sure what kind because I can't see the underside, uh, but it's warming its wings. Butterflies, you will not find butterflies flying around when it's cold or rainy outside. When it's rainy, they have to close their wings and hide under vegetation so the scales don't get washed off of them. Um, and it also tends to be really cold. So warm, sunny days. The general rule of thumb is if you're comfortable outside in a t-shirt, then it's a good day for butterflies. The other cool thing about butterflies you might see them doing sometimes is gathering on damp soil, like these pale swallowtails in the checker spot. Um, this was along the Metolius River, I believe. Um, but really anywhere there's damp soil, the but, uh, certain butterfly species especially, um, will gather and they sip salts and minerals through their proboscis. So they can't get everything they need from flowers and they'll, they'll go to the damp soil. If we go for a long period of time and they can't find damp so soil, they actually have the ability to spit through their proboscis, um, release the salts and minerals in the soil and then suck them back up. <clears throat> Pretty cool. Okay. So hopefully now you're feeling really inspired and full of joy because you've just seen a whole bunch of butterflies and you'll be motivated to do something to help them. And the cool thing about helping butterflies is that you end up helping all the pollinator species or at least the bees as well, which desperately need our help. And please do not ask me bee questions at the end because I am just now learning about bees and I probably can't answer your questions about bees, but I'm working on it. Um, anyway, very simple thing you can do is plant a pollinator garden. And if you don't have a yard to plant in or you're renting, doesn't matter. It's, it makes a huge difference even just to get a big container and chuck it full of flowers really anything, there is no size limit. Like you don't have to have a certain amount of land to make a difference. You can just do it in a container pot. That's the awesome thing about this. Um, if you do have a little bit of space, um, planting a diversity of flowers is great. Planting native flowers is even better. And we have a great list of native pollinator friendly central organ hardy flowers on our website. And I bet Rebecca can, I don't know, post a link in the chat or direct 
you um, afterwards where you can find that on our website. But a really great thing to do too is to try to have different flowers blooming at different times so that at any time, spring through fall, you've got something blooming. Um, one of the neat things I think about butterflies is that different species emerge at different times of the year. And it all like it depends on how they overwinter because some butterflies overwinter as an egg, some as a caterpillar, some as a chrysalis, like the swallowtails, pretty cool, um, and some as adults. So depending upon when they come out, they, they need food um, and shelter and moisture. And so having things that bloom all through the growing season is great. If you do have some space, also it's nice to plant in clumps, like in this picture. Um, of course, we always push uh, for folks to plant natives, but it is okay too to mix in some non-natives. I just planted a pollinator garden this year with my kids, and there's some non-native plants that we live, you know, in a neighborhood surrounded by concrete. We don't have to worry about non-natives making it out into the wild. Um, and there's some that are really pretty that also attract bees and butterflies. And so we included those and that's okay. Um, you definitely want to include milkweed and you have to have patience because <laughs> milkweed can be a little challenging, um, but it's totally worth it. And it also, it's helpful to have patience because it takes a while to bloom. It usually takes like three years before you actually get blooms. And I have uh, milkweed in my um, raised bed outside that is finally getting blooms on it this year, the third year I've had it. I'm just over the moon about it. Um, this is a picture of showy milkweed. Another native milkweed um, to Central Oregon is narrow leaf. And I will say when it comes to milkweed, please only plant native, showy or narrow leaf. And I can explain that more later if you're interested. Um, and then the other thing that's really important to keep in mind if you are going to have a garden, whether it's in a container pot or your backyard, an entire meadow, whatever you got, um, is to be really careful and not use harmful chemicals. One of the number one challenges that pollinators are facing um, is a class of chemicals called neonicotinoids. They are awful. They are systemic. So when they're applied to the plant, the plant tissue absorbs it and it is expressed through pollen, through nectar, it's in the leaves. So any stage of butterfly, like if there's a caterpillar chewing the leaf, um, it will likely die. If a bee comes along to gather pollen or sip nectar, it will, uh, nectar, it'll likely die. It, it does depend on how much of the chemical is on the plant but even a small amount can have really awful impacts. So please be sure when you're shopping that you're shopping at a place that only sells plants that are neonicotinoid free. And with that, I think I'll take a drink of water <laughs> and open it up to questions. Gosh, I just... So uh, I'll give you a break from talking for a moment. <laughs> Um, just a moment though, because I don't like to hear my own voice, but um, we'll turn it back to you. We've got some good questions and I will um, start it off with a couple that, one that maybe I can answer while you finish drinking your water. So there is um, a question here that says, what are some tips for IDing butterflies and what are some local guides and things like that? So Amanda recently gave a talk um, last winter, um, I guess maybe now a whole year ago, about um, monarch butterflies and after that talk we created a blog post about some good monarch but also other butterfly related resources and that included some guidebooks. Amanda has one and she's told me it's her, uh, her there it is, it's right there, her monarch um, and butterfly book. Uh, it's always with her it seems like. Um, so we have that resource already and, and we'll be sure to share that as well as some pollinator garden resources and um, a bit more about milkweed and monarchs and what the land trust is doing there. Um, so I think that kind of covers that question. Um, Amanda, do you want to add anything? Yeah. yeah. May I just add just maybe two things to that? Um, one thing is don't, you don't have to try to memorize every, I mean, I went through a lot of species today and the reason I did that was just to give you a, a sampling of the incredible diversity we have here. But usually when I'm leading a tour um, outside and we're talking about butterflies, I say like really if the first thing you can do is differentiate a monarch from all other butterflies, that's a huge step because a lot of folks, you know, see a butterfly and assume it's a monarch. 
And then I think the next step would be to start to recognize the butterflies in the different families. Um, so when I'm out like on a two hour tour, we'll, we'll start to work on that. And it's like, don't necessarily worry about the fact that it's a spring azure or um, a Western tiger swallowtail. Just like think about the bigger picture and the, you know, starting to group butterflies into the different families. Is a, is a good way to start, I think. And then I will just say, I mean, I don't have a deal going with Bob Pyle or anything, but this book is incredible because it shows you all the counties in the state. So you'll know it really narrows things down for you. He also has these really great pages that show like, um, I don't know if I can, I might not be able to find one fast enough, but it'll like show you a whole bunch of wings side by side, and that's really helpful, and just gives you lots of great information, fun little tidbits so that you feel like you get to know the individual butterflies. It's not just about naming it. You know, just because you can name something doesn't mean that you really understand it, but you can actually read about the host plants and the nectar plants and the types of habitats, and it's a way, I think, to really feel closer to nature. Okay, that's it. That was great. Thank you for sharing. And that answered another one of our questions, too. Um, the next one, maybe jumping back into moths and butterflies, can you tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth when they're still a caterpillar? Ooh, that's harder. Um, a, a lot of, oh, no, you can't. I was going to say, sometimes you'll hear people say, well, if it's hairy, it's a moth, if it's smooth skin, it's a butterfly. It's not always true though. It's, it's really hard. You know, okay, here, here's another great resource. Um, if you really wanna geek out on this, like obviously I do, but this is the life histories. This is probably totally obnoxious to hold this up like this. I don't know if anybody can actually see it, but it's the life histories of Cascadia butterflies. It's by David James um, and another guy. I'm sorry, I know David James, <laughs> I don't know the other guy. But it actually shows you like a million, every butterfly that exists here, it shows you every instar stage of every butterfly's caterpillar. So like crazy. Um, so if you really want to get into caterpillars, um, that's a good one. There's another one too, and I can give all this to you, Rebecca, afterwards. I don't know if all this is on our website, but this is caterpillars in the field and garden. This is another really good one. I will confess that I'm, I'm not really good with caterpillars because they're hard to see. You know, every once in a while you'll, you'll see one um, and you'll be like, what's that? And um, I always have to look it up unless it's a monarch or a swallowtail. I pretty much don't know. Um, so there is not one tried and true way. I am sorry. I wish there was. But I can tell you, you can always tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth when it's in the chrysalis or cocoon stage because the butterfly, as you saw, creates a chrysalis. And of course, all chrysalids look different, but it's always that one shape that's usually suspended from something, whereas a moth creates a cocoon, which tends to be like a bunch of woven things around its body. Very different appearance. Thanks, Amanda. That was great. <laughs> I love woven things around bodies. Um, this is maybe a quick one, and maybe you have the answer, maybe you don't. I'm going to test you. Um, what is the biggest butterfly? The, in the world? I'll tell you. The, I don't know. The biggest butterfly in the Pacific Northwest is the two-tailed swallowtail. Boom. I knew that one. <laughs> you it. How big, do you know how big it is? Like, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's like that. It's, it's. It's a little bit bigger than a Western tiger swallowtail. And in, it looks a lot like the Western tiger swallowtail, but instead of, you know, the, West, the Western tiger swallowtail just has like one tail on each hind wing, this one has two on each hind wing. Yeah. You're 100% so far. Um, this one, you touched on it a little bit, but why are spiders big predators for butterflies? Because they're mean. No, I'm just kidding. Spiders are important and I love them. <laughs> um, really wild, if you ever see this, um, crab spiders that reside in flowers, what they'll do, it's pretty cool. So a butterfly will come down to sip nectar 
And as it's perched on the flower, it's got its proboscis down getting the nectar, the crab spider is hiding inside the flower and it'll just start sucking up the belly <laughs> of the butterfly. And it is a wild thing to observe. Um, but it's cool, you gotta, you gotta respect that, right? That's a pretty cool strategy. Um, so if you ever walk past a plant, like a flower, and you accidentally like, may, let's say it's on a trail and you're hiking somewhere and the vegetation is kind of closed in on the trail, you walk past, you accidentally brush it with your leg and you see there's a butterfly on a flower. If that butterfly does not move, it is currently the meal of a crab spider, without a doubt. Um, butterflies also sometimes get caught in spider webs. You know, they don't, they don't really bother with the wings so much. I mean, none of the critters that eat butterflies really do. They just focus on the juicy abdomen. That's where the good stuff is. Thanks, Amanda. There are a few more questions, so I'm gonna keep us going. Um, the next one might be helpful for folks. So how do you find butterflies? Where should we go? What do we look for? And why, Amanda, are butterflies so drawn to landing on you? <laughs> they know that I love them, clearly. <laughs> um, I don't know why they're drawn to me. I'm lucky. Um, no, maybe, so I'll tell you what, I'll tell you a hint. It's a little clue, I didn't mention this. Great way to get a butterfly to land on you is to be sweaty, <laughs> is to be out in the forest on a hot, hot day when it's almost too hot to move and butterflies will love to land on your arm or on your nose um, and suck up all the, the salts. Like they can get from the soil, they can get it from your skin too. It's pretty cool. Um, but where do you go? Remember when we talked about the diversity of butterflies and how they're so tightly associated with plant communities, you gotta go where there are lots of plants. Like the more plants there are and the more things there are in bloom, I would say, um, and also the more chance you'll have seeing a decent amount of them. Um, it's also helpful if there's water, shelter uh, nearby because they need those things as well. Um, but really it's, it's going where, and they don't, you know, I say flowers because of the nectar, um, but obviously they're laying their eggs on leaves and those plants do not need to be in bloom at the time. So you don't always have to have blooms. Sometimes in grassy meadows, you'll also see a lot because there are quite a few uh, species of butterflies that use grasses as host plants. Um, so yeah, I think pretty, and honestly, you can see them downtown. Go for a walk. If you want to go do a brewery tour, you just walk, oh, maybe not during COVID, huh? Um, but really in urban areas as well. Super, then this one is a bit related. So is it okay to touch a butterfly? And, and what is the deal with that? And how many scales do they have? Was kind of the question. Wow, okay. Um, that's a, such a good question. I am so glad that somebody asked that. It is really important um, to not sneak up to a butterfly and try to grab it by its wings like this, um, because our skin has oils on it and those oils do pull off the wings. Obviously you see the background image right now is a butterfly on a hand. So you're like, you hypocrite, <laughs> you're handling a butterfly. Um, and that is my hand in the background and my child's hand like this. When, when the butterfly, it is totally fine to have a butterfly land on you. You know, if the butterfly just comes and alights on your arm or on your hand or on your nose or on your head or wherever, no harm done because you're not touching the scales. You know, its, it's feet are pretty much on you. Um, but if, I don't know how many scales a butterfly has. Obviously, that would be related to its size. A gazillion. How about that? <laughs> Um, when I'm leading a butterfly tour, we net butterflies and then put them in jars and pass them around and then open up the jar lid and let it fly away. There are some times when I will use uh, forceps um, and there's something that I, that I got from like a, a, a science supply catalog and they're, if you ever do that, um, you, you want to make sure they don't have any ridges on them. They need to be smooth, but that's another way to get around putting your, you don't want to put your fingers on them if you don't have to. Using a forcep um, is, has much less impact because it doesn't have the oil. 
Okay, I'll say you passed on that one. Um, definitely, thank you. The next one is, do you know what the best host and nectar plants are for the Western tiger swallowtails? Um, I looked that up recently because I was wondering why I get so many swallowtails on my mock orange. And in the Bob Pyle book, he talks a lot about willow um, and other like broadleaf shrub species, but there are quite a few. And I, I will let you know if I find an egg on my mock orange, but I wouldn't be surprised if they might lay an egg on mock orange too. Um, but willow for sure. And I can actually, um, I can find that butterfly really fast in my book. So let me just read here and see. Host plants, broadleaf trees, including big leaf maples, willows, aspen, black cottonwood, and plain trees in cities. Uh, and nectars on yarrow, balsam root, teasel, alfalfa, sweet william, red columbine, phlox, lilac, rhododendron, dendron and he doesn't say mock orange but definitely mock orange <laughs> and that's why you always have to have the book handy <laughs> that's right um so the next one there are two questions here about overwintering so the first question is do morning cloaks and california tortoise shells that come out during the warm winter days do they perish or do they fold back up and hide do they hibernate and then the second question is, how in the world can a butterfly survive the winter? Awesome. Maybe the first one's easier. No, it's uh, there, but so they do not perish. Um, well, I mean, I don't know. I guess if they got hit by a car, they might, but <laughs> when they were out enjoying the winter sun, but no, it does not hurt them to come out and fly around. All they, they just, as it starts to get cooler, you know, the days are pretty short in the winter, so it might just come out for a few hours in the warmest part of the day. And then um, as it starts to, to cool down, you know, they, they sense that. Um, and they'll just go back and hide, either in the same place they were or in a new place. Um, how on earth do they survive? You know, I ask that question about a lot of creatures. Um, I was just watching a really cool nature show with my kids last night about animal survival in the winter. Um, and they all have strategies, different strategies. I think it's really interesting um, that different butterfly species utilize different strategies, like the swallowtails that spend the winter in a chrysalis. Um, and they seem to have good success doing that. And in fact, they can sense environmental conditions outside of their chrysalis. And in the spring, if they don't feel like it's going to be a good year for them, they can hang out on their chrysalis an entire another year before they close. Um, other species, you know, hanging out as a caterpillar under the leaf litter or burrowed slightly in the ground. Um, and the adults, I think the same, they're, they're in something called reproductive diapause. So when they come out and about in the winter, there's really nothing for them to eat and they don't mate at that point. They're just flitting about. Um, and when they hibernate, their, their body just really slows down. It's like a sort of like a state of torpor um, or hibernation that frogs and other critters go into. I, I don't know the science behind it. I can't tell you about antifreeze in their wings or anything like that, um, but it is, it is amazing for sure. Thanks, Amanda. Well, the last question was, if you could tell us about your favorite butterfly and why that is. Um, and we've got just a couple minutes left. I don't know if you want to say anything about the butterfly and then um, any final words about butterflies until next time. My favorite butterfly is the Melissa Blue. Why? I, I don't know. It's because something so tiny that only lives for like a week puts so much energy into looking so incredibly beautiful, like a tiny little peacock with sparkly glitter blows my mind. It's just a tiny little treasure. And so if you don't, I guess maybe why I love that too is because it's a reminder to me to slow down, slow down and look and take the time, just take the time to sit outside. Um, and maybe those will be my parting words as well, especially you know, in this crazy time, this crazy world so much going on. I often feel totally ungrounded. And my solution for getting my feet back grounded is to go out and be peaceful in nature and just watch these little miracles happening all around me.
Well, thanks, Amanda, so much um, for sharing all your great butterfly knowledge and um, helping us all have a little bit of hopeful butterflying time on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, if you didn't catch it earlier, folks, Amanda is going to be doing another presentation focusing in on the monarch butterfly. You might have heard that the Deschutes Land Trust is doing quite a bit of work um, related to monarch butterflies um, and our pollinators and native plants, specifically those native milkweeds. So if you would like to tune into that, uh, we will have information coming out on that again shortly. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. And if you're interested in other opportunities to connect through your screen with nature in some kind of way, um, definitely visit our website to find those other opportunities. And we will see you again sometime soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much.